Okay, so I'd like to welcome all of you to a Bible study this evening. We're going to do something a little bit different. Um, we would normally be scheduled to be celebrating the 27th Sunday of Ordinary Time, but we're not going to. So um, Richard Clark and I kind of made a prudential decision. Well, like we did for the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, we parked that on the Sunday rather than the Ordinary Sunday. And so October 4th is the feast of, or the, the memorial of St. Francis of Assisi. And because um, he has a great devotion to St. Francis, I have a great devotion to St. Francis, we're going to be celebrating the memorial of St. Francis of Assisi for Sunday, and that's what we're going to be doing for Bible study tonight. How big a deal is St. Francis? Well, I mean, I've always had a personal... Um, he, he's been very important for me as a saint. Uh, he was very important for my mother. I had a great aunt who was a Franciscan nun at St. Francis College, or St. Francis Convent in Little Falls. And then I've got a number of those nuns from that convent that are personal friends of mine. My dad grew up in a Franciscan parish. You know that the Franciscans, they had a seminary in Chaska, Assumption Seminary. And so they did Chaska, Jordan, Victoria, and a number of towns right around there. So my dad and my grandparents were with Franciscans the whole time. So it's really great. So I'm, I'm really glad. When I was at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, we had five different Franciscan communities that, were, that made up the 33 communities that were at Catholic Theological Union. So St. Francis is, is a big deal. And hopefully um, this will be an interesting and fruitful uh, Bible study that we have tonight on St. Francis. Now, the... Um, hmm? Yeah, so I mean, so she was saying that there was a Francis in the family too, and so a b big deal for her family, and we're re rejoicing with you on that. And there is a Saint Isabel. And we talked about that Queen Isabella from Spain, and it's a, der a derivative, I think, of Elizabeth, right? So it's drawn off of a Saint name beside, and you're a Saint in training to boot. So there's going to be a Saint, Isab a saint Isabel anyway, even if there wasn't one, you know? So this psalm is, taking, is taken from the Mass for St. Francis, and when you know about his simplicity and his generosity with the poor, hopefully you'll be able to hear the connect between this psalm and St. Francis. God's dawn dawns through the darkness, a light for the upright. God is gracious and merciful to the just. Well for the man who is gracious and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice, he shall never be moved. The just man shall be in everlasting remembrance. An evil report he shall not fear. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steadfast. He shall not fear till he looks down upon his foes. Lavishly he gives to the poor. His generosity shall endure forever. His horn shall be exalted in glory. So, Almighty God, as we come before you tonight in prayer, we thank you for the great saint that you have blessed your church with, St. Francis. He was a man who was completely devoted to your son, Jesus. He gave his life to him. He served him generously for all of the days of his life. He gathered many around him to serve likewise. He had a great and deep devotion to your cross. He spread that devotion to so many others. He helped people to live together in community. He spread the message of the gospel. Through his uh, intercession and through his inspiration, may, be, may we be strengthened in our faith and draw closer to you. And every night, Lord, when we come together to do these Bible studies, we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit, that it would fill our minds, fill our hearts, so that we would love you more and always walk in your ways. And we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. All right, so we have two handouts tonight. The first one is a, 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 almost like a little booklet on St. Francis of Assisi. And so let's, we'll use that first, okay? So you'll see on the cover that you've got a picture of St. Francis, and it's like a three-page short biography of his life. We're going to go through all of this during the slideshow. And so you'll just be able to follow along point by point. It's pretty interesting, hopefully, and informative. Then when you go on to the next pages, you'll see that there's the San Damiano Cross, which is the famous cross from the San Damiano Church, which is immediately outside of Assisi. And then there's the Franciscan Tau Cross. And then on the next page, you'll see the Franciscan Blue Cross. All three of those crosses will be presented in the slideshow, and we'll look at all of the symbolism and meaning. They're contained in the articles, but we'll be able to go through them with the program. 
then the Franciscans are the custodians of the Holy Land. We're not going to do anything with that in the slideshow, but I just wanted to be able to include that for you. And then I've got a couple of the great prayers that are attributed to St. Francis at the end. The Canticle of Brother Son, which is one, and then the Prayer of St. Francis, which I think you're uh, quite familiar with, and we'll use it to close tonight. Okay? So let's move on now and um, look at our little slideshow. Little slideshow, there's 110 slides. It's way longer than our normal one. I thought we want to get to the full deal tonight, and so this will be great. So we, we got the title slide, St. Francis of Assisi. And so you know that Assisi is in Italy. And so this particular slide, it shows you, um, it says Saint and Francis, and over here it says 13th century. So in Oatana, in the church in Oatana, in St. Joseph's, um, they've got 20 stained glass windows, and they've got the greatest saint for each one of those centuries. And in the estimation of those people, he was the greatest saint of the 13th century. If you ask the Franciscans, he's the greatest saint of all. And really, there are many people who believe that he imitated Jesus more radically and more perfectly than any other saint and hold him up after the Blessed Mother as the greatest of all saints. You know, so this is really, a, it's a quite, a, quite a thing for him. Now, he's from Italy, so this is just a topographical map of the way Italy is. You know, so you've got the Mediterranean Sea down here, um, and then you got the Adriatic, and there's another sea on this side, and you can see that there's a core of mountains, just like the mountains goes down through the west here. So there's a very mountainous central, central part of, uh, of Italy, and the boot, okay? And so we're going to try and talk about where he's from. So here's Rome. It's, this is the capital. It's about halfway up, and it's on the west coast. Um, so the place where um, St. Francis was from was Umbria. And so Umbria is not shown on the map. So you see where the word Italy is? Umbria is right where the A is. So it's north of Rome and the central part of Italy. Now, this is very strange. So we would have a slideshow on St. Francis, and we're opening with a picture of St. John. That does not fit at all, does it? So his mom and dad um, were very devout Christians, and they baptized him Giovanni, John, which is like, what? So his name is Francis. How, does he get, how was he baptized Giovanni, and how does that all add up? Well, the deal is, and so we've got Francisco here. So his name was changed from Giovanni to Francisco. So his dad was a textile merchant. I think that you know that he had all these fabrics and all this stuff. He was selling all this stuff. And so he was a very prominent man, very noble, wealthy man that lived in um, Assisi, but because of his uh, trade, he had to be on journeys all the time. And so he was a real businessman. So he made a couple of trips to France. And he came back from France and liked France so much that he named his son Francesco. Francis, it comes from the word France. And so he changed from Giovanni to Francisco. All right. So anyhow, here we go. Now, you can't see this too well, I don't think, but you see where Rome is, okay? You see the word Perugia there? Perugia was the sister city, or the city that was right next to Assisi. And actually what happened was, is that after St. Francis was born, when he got to be 20 years old, there was a, a, a mini war, a skirmish, that happened between the people of Perugia and the people of Assisi. Um, Francis was captured when he was 20 years old and went into prison. So here we have an, a prison cell. And so he spent an entire year from 20 to 21 in prison, in jail. I mean, it was a terrible time for him. I think that, I don't know if you've ever seen any of these things, it's not like today. I mean, it's not like you've got modern construction. They were damp and dark and ugly, and he got sick. So he spent almost the whole year in prison being very sick. And so here we show him between a couple of guards in the prison cell, and here we have him, that's not him, I've got a picture of a young person laying in bed with an angel nearby, okay? So what happened was is that when he was sick, he certainly had the protection of his guardian angel, but in addition to the protection of his guardian angel, it was a time for him to do a lot of meditation, and he spent almost the whole year in prayer. Okay, I mean, so he came from a very strong, faith-filled tradition um, with his mom and dad, and so even though he, as a youngster, he was uh, a very, he was a troubadour, and he fooled around, and he was a joyful kid, and all this sort of thing, got into some trouble, whatever, but here he's having a very prayerful time. Now, that, how he got out of jail at, at the end of one year, it's not known for sure. I think that there is, uh, some people would say 
that his dad did some, um, you know, he had some money and was able to get him out of jail, um, and so he was able to get him to come home. So what happened was he did come home, and I've got folded hands there, so when he was 21, he got out of jail, he went home, and he was sick for the next year. So, I mean, he was sick for two full years, and I mean, so these days, we don't have that so much because we have medications and we have all kinds of good treatment. In those days, illnesses would linger longer, okay? So as he's praying, he heard a voice of Jesus speaking to him, and he knew that he was being called by Jesus, so he had a very deep conversion experience between the time he was 21 and 22. So as he's having this conversion, he's contemplating what God's calling him to do, how he's going to spend the rest of his life. Maybe I should be a soldier. Because, I mean, that was one of the things that people did very much in those days. So he went out and got himself all of the armor and all of the equipment that you need. He got himself a horse, and he was all set to go. But he had a very compassionate heart for people who were unfortunate. So we've got this next one. This is actually not Francis. This is St. Martin de Porres. But I had to get somebody that would, something that would be similar to this. So you remember when St. Martin de Porres had this, his big cloak on, and he found this beggar at the city gate, and he cut his cloak in half and gave it to him? St. Francis had a very similar event happen. So he was on his horse with all of his stuff, and he came to a poor guy in very tattered clothes, and he got off of his, off of his horse, and they traded clothes. He gave him the good clothes, and he took the poor clothes. You know, and so he was always reaching out to the poor. Well, you know, Dad was, not, was really excited about this. Not. Okay, so this didn't enamor him to his father at all. So now he spends yet even more time in prayer. And he's trying to figure out what God's calling him to do. And so he figures out that he has to lead a life of more asceticism. He has to give up things and do fasting and all of that. And he has to give money to the poor. And so he wears these old, tattered clothes out in the city square where all the people can see him. I mean, so he's nobility, and they're all mocking him and making fun of him, and he's an embarrassment to his dad. His dad's going, my son is crazy. He's a 23-year-old nut, okay? So what happens was his dad apprehended him, grabbed him, took him to the warehouse, and locked him in a room and said, you sit in here and you think about it. So he's got him locked out. He's, he's like making like him like a prisoner in his own warehouse, he, and so it's locked from the inside. He, he can't lock it. I mean, it's locked on the outside. He can't get out. So they just brought him food and whatever. Dad went on a business trip. All right. Dad goes on a business trip. What does mother do? She lets him out. Exactly what a good mother would do. All right. He knows that he's in trouble with dad. So he gets let out of the room where he's locked up, and he goes to San Damiano. So San Damiano is a little bitty place, little bitty church, right outside of Assisi. There had an old church there. The thing was falling apart. They had a priest that was there. He goes and talks to the priest at San Damiano. Can I move in with you? Guy goes, absolutely. I'll be prayerful. Francis is saying to him, I'll do my steel and whatever, and I'll just be with you. So it worked out great. So now he's at the San Damiano church, and he goes inside the church, and he kneels before a crucifix. And I think that you're familiar with the story, huh? So I mean, right now he's maybe 24 years old, and he's kneeling before the crucifix, and he hears a voice from Jesus saying, Francis, rebuild my church, which you can see is in disrepair. Well, Francis thought for sure that he was talking about the church building because the church building was a mess, and it was falling apart. And he's going, how are we ever going to get the money to be able to do this rebuilding project? So what happened was, so here he is. You, so on the last one, you can see the cross, huh? This one is a, little bit, is a little bit more subtle. You see the crucifix here? So he's kneeling in front of it. Now here's another artist's version of him. He's standing instead of kneeling. But can you see the cross there? And so you can see the skull too. A lot of times they put this in. St. Jerome did this too. It's like, remember that you're going to die. You have to live your life being ready for judgment and you have to be a good person. Okay? So this is a close-up of, 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 of Francis looking at the cross and hearing Jesus speak to him about rebuild my church. Okay, so what he did then, this is a beautiful garment that's all nicely embroidered with cross things and so forth. You know, his father had tons of garments. And so dad's out of town. I'm going to make some money. So Francis goes in and he takes a ton of the garments out. I'm going to go sell these. We're going to make some money to build and fix that church. Not only that, 
he goes and gets one of his dad's horses. So he's got dad's horse, dad's garments, goes to the neighboring village, sells it all, gets a bunch of money, never got any permission from his father. So he comes back to town with the money. So you know me, we got money bags, right? So we got a satchel full of money and we've done a good job and we're ready to come back home and all that sort of thing. And so he goes up to the priest and says, Father, I got the money. We're going to be able to start the renovation project on the church. Well, you know the priest? He knew his dad. And he says, does your father know what you just did? He says, no, my father doesn't know. He says, I'm not taking that money. I mean, so he was a smart guy, but he's not going to get in the middle of that deal, all right? Okay, so now the priest doesn't take the money, and he's got all this money, and what am I going to do? And this was supposed to be to rebuild the church and all of that. So he just decides to go out to the city square. And now, while he's at the city square, and this is the current city square, right, in this easy right now, and it's, it's exactly the way it was 800 years ago. So, I mean, it really is very true to life and all of that. And so he just is in his tattered clothes out begging for more money to rebuild the church. You know how his dad feels about this? He's ballistic. So dad knows the bishop. You're going to love the bishop's name, Guido. <laughs> bishop Guido. So what happens is, is that dad and Bishop Guido call him for an appearance before the bishop. And so, the, so here we have the bishop. And so the bishop comes out to the square. So bishop and dad are out there. And we're going to try and talk some sense into this boy and get this to happen. And he's going to finally get his money back. So you can imagine that the bishop and his dad are standing out here. And there's a huge crowd of people around. And Francis would have been standing right in the front of them. And so, and so Bishop Guido is going, you got to give the money back to your dad. And dad's standing there waiting for it. And Francis looks at him and says, you know something? I renounce the family business. I no longer lay claim to my inheritance. You can keep your money. And you know something? The money that I went for the horse and the textiles, here's the money. And you know these clothes that I'm wearing, they're yours. I'm going to give them back to you. And he's standing right there in the square and he stripped himself naked and gave everything back to his dad and said, you can have it all. I don't owe you a thing. I'm for the Lord and for the Lord alone. Hmm. So the people are looking at this naked 24-year-old sitting there standing in the square. They're all thinking, wow, this guy's crazy. All right? And so they said, you know, we, we can't allow this guy to be standing out here naked. So somebody found a brown tunic to put over him. Hence, we have the Franciscan habit. That's where it came from, just a poor garment to cover up this poor guy in his nakedness after he had done all that. Amazing. We'll come back to your questions later, okay? Now, from this point on, now he's in his Franciscan tunic, he's living down with the priest, um, he's kind of separated himself from his family, and doing this really remarkable work. One of the things that he did the most was giving food to the poor. I mean, he was very, very sensitive to the poor, a very compassionate heart, and so um, you see these over and over again. This is at the church in Delano. And this is another one. I forget which churches this is at. But you get a cross in the background, food in one hand, giving food to the poor people in the other hand. So giving food to folks. This was what he was very, very much about. So the other thing he starts doing is that he realized somehow through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that when Jesus said, rebuild my church, he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about the church is the body of Christ, it's the people, and the people's faith had grown lukewarm and lax, and it was time to rebuild the faith of the people. So he becomes this great preacher. And so here we are, and so he's um, preaching, and he's preaching the cross, he's preaching Christ crucified, and look at this. Get doves. What's the deal with the doves? He teaches about Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, and remember about we have the peace prayer, that he has, he was huge on peace. And so he's preaching Christ, preaching priest, preaching priest, preaching peace, and going, and he, the crowds just keep getting bigger and bigger as he goes around his preaching. And so there we have a couple more doves. Here we have him in a kind of a preaching posture with the book of the, uh, the Gospels in his hand. This is at a, the Church of Our Lady of the Universe in Orlando, Florida. Love to know where I go on vacation, huh? 
There we are. This is a very beautiful thing. So this is a mosaic in the church of St. Catherine in Bethlehem. And so we're here we have St. Francis with baby Jesus. Well, that doesn't work. They're only 1,200 years apart. But you know one of the things that St. Francis did is he popularized Christmas. And he preached about Christmas. He said, you know something? We ought to put up little displays of Christmas to tell the story. He was the first one who um, did the creche. Okay, so you know like when we do manger scenes and all of that? In the 1200s, he popularized that. They had never done it before. So, we, you know, when you put up your Christmas decorations, and if you put up a manger scene, you can go, thank you, St. Francis, for that little piece. Okay? So that was part of his Christmas preaching. So as he was going along, not only was he preaching, and not only was giving food to the poor, he was inspiring young people to follow him, too. So all of a sudden, he's got one follower, then he's got two, then he's got five, then he's got a dozen. All of a sudden, he's got a community forming. It's an amazing thing. So by 1210... He's got a community formed, and he writes an elementary first rule of life, okay? So then he goes to see Pope Innocent III, um, the Holy Father at the Vatican, and he says, I'd like to start a religious order. Now, you know that I was with the Croziers. The Croziers founded in the exact same year, in 1210. So when Francis went to the Holy Father, I mean, so he's just a youngster. I mean, he's not even 30 years old yet. And the Holy Father's going, yeah, sure, you want to start a religious order, sure. Um, I think we have enough religious orders already, we're going to not do it. So Francis stayed at Rome and said, I really would like to do it. So the Holy Father slept that night and had a dream of St. Francis holding up the Lateran Basilica. The Holy Father called him in the next day and says, you know something? Got a message from the Lord, you can do it. So it was approved. He got tentative approval then and he would get formal approval 10 years later. So now we have another statue here. This is St. Clair or St. Clara. This is at Mission Santa Clara in Santa Clara, California. So when he gets back there, he's got his group of men, and she founds a group of women. And so actually Francis ends up being like the spiritual director for St. Clara and gets them all set together. They were like called the the poor uh, women of Assisi or something to that effect. Now we know them as the poor Clares. And so they're cloistered order and all of that. Great devotion to the Eucharist and a pastor's staff because she was the mother superior of the community. And so the two of them worked together in great cooperation as they founded these two religious orders. His religious order is going crazy. It's all of a sudden got 3,000 members. It was a tremendous growth. So then he got deathly sick. So in 1224, so he's now 42 years old, um, he has taken a, a, a serious turn for the worse. And so he's laying in bed, and so the next couple of years, he's just going to basically be out of circulation. But um, on September 14th, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, he went to Mount Alverno to pray, and he said, Lord Jesus, I got a couple of things that I would like before I come to the end of my life. I would like to share the suffering that you had in your life, and I would like to have the kind of love that you had that I could have that love for others. And on September 14th, In 1224, he received the stigmata. You've heard of the stigmata, right? Those are the wounds of Christ's passion. He was the first person to receive it. Now, a number of other people have received it afterwards. So he had the wounds in his hands, his feet, and the wound in his side. So here he is just sick. And this particular picture is in the um, Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi. All right. So he then right away got the wounds in his hands. This is a statue at the Church of the Flagellation in Jerusalem. I like it because it does a very nice job showing all of the wounds. So this is the statue when you're looking at it from a ways. Then we're looking up close. Wound in one hand, wound in the other hand. See the wound in this side? They actually made a rip in his his, uh, his, uh, habit. I mean, there wouldn't have been a rip there. I mean, he would have covered it up. But that was just for artistic purposes so that you can see the wound. So here's a close-up of the right side. Right hand and the wound in this side. And then you have the left hand, and he's holding the cross because he had a tremendously deep devotion to the cross of Christ. Okay, and you can see the feet there. I'm sorry about the glare, but there's a wound here, and there's a wound there, so we have all five of them. This is another uh, one, of, one of the missions in California. And so, you know, the Fran- they're all Franciscan missions, so there's St. Francis is everywhere in the missions in, in, in California. So he's got the great devotion to the cross, and he sews the wounds of the stigmata. There's the wound close up. 
This is an interesting mosaic. It's on the Church of All Nations in um, Jerusalem, down in the Kidron Valley, about right at Gethsemane. And so the Franciscans, as you know, are the custodians of the Holy Land, huh? So you would naturally put um, some artwork that commemorates St. Francis there. And so there's a mosaic of it, and this is a close-up of it. And notice here, you've got the wound in one hand and the wound in the other. So this is now, so St. Francis then dies in 1226. 44 years old, that's all. He didn't live a very long life. And it was amazing, the devotion to him was incredible, and already they're getting ready to uh, bury him there. They're going to build a basilica. It was 20, I forget how many years, it was 22, 20 or 22 years later that Pope Gregory uh, canonized him as saint. So very shortly after he died, he was canonized. Give you an idea of the kind of devotion that people had to him. And so you see him here. And so, I mean, you often, often see him with animals because he had such a good heart. And a lot of times on August 4th or October 4th on his feast day, there will be the blessing of the animals. And people will bring their dogs to church. And people will bring their cats to church. And maybe even their hamsters or their parakeets. They do that at the Basilica. They do it a couple of other places. I've never done it at a church where I've been at. I didn't want to clean up the mess. <laughs> All right, so you, hear him, see him, so you see him here with a deer. I love this particular one. This is at Mount Tabor I'm in Israel. And so this is a very popular piece of uh, Franciscan art. So Jesus is on the cross, and he's reaching down from the cross. Francis is at the foot of the cross, and he's placing his arm around him. There's a closer-up version of it. That was the first time I ever saw it. When I went to the Franciscan missions, they have them everywhere. So this is a painting of Santa Clara of the same thing. So you can see it a little bit more close up. Jesus' love for Francis, Francis' love for Jesus, and they both have the stigmata or the wounds of the passion, and he has a deep devotion to the cross. So this is at the Terra Sancta College in, uh, in Jerusalem, and they have a beautiful statue. There he is holding a cross. You're going to see that the readings that we use for Sunday are going to, both of them are going to have really powerful expressions of the cross. Now this is the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi. Beautiful, beautiful Basilica. And so I've had a, a great opportunity to be there twice and had mass on the lower level at his tomb both times. And so this is the, uh, on the kind of the, 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 the rest of the city as you look the other direction. I mean, it's very ancient, very medieval type, a lot of stone work and so forth. It's very beautiful. This is the plaza as you come down to the basilica. Then there's the lawn right, uh, right out front of the church. And this is great. So you see this thing is built in the shape of a T. And we're going to talk to you in just a few moments about the Tau Cross. And in Latin, it's P-A-X, peace. So these are great Franciscan messages. And so this is the lower level entryway, which is the way that most people go. And as you come into the entryway, there's a beautiful statue of Jesus with the 12 apostles. And that other uh, little thing that I showed you with um, Francis and the 12, his, his, the, his first friars, they're side by side. And then this is the Franciscan emblem. We've talked about that before, right? The crisscrossed arms. And so the arm that's bare is the arm of Jesus because he was stripped of his garments. And the arm that has a habit on it that's the arm of Francis, and they both have wounds in their hands. This is another one with the Tau cross behind it. So you can see the one with the, the, one with the uh, habit, the one that's bare. This is Jesus, that's Francis, and the Tau cross. Jesus actually was crucified on a Tau-shaped cross, and we're going to show you a picture of that coming up. Okay, so as you walk into the church, there's a beautiful one where the Blessed Mother is appearing to St. Clair, and St. Francis, because those are the two that are featured at the church there. And of course, the Blessed Mother is going to be there. This is one of my favorites. This is a, a fresco up on the upper level as you, as you walk by over to the museum. And it's a painting of Jesus carrying his cross. Remember, he said, you have to pick up your cross and follow in my footsteps. So Francis is literally picking up his cross and following in his footsteps. But Jesus is looking back to Francis, and Francis has his eyes focused on Jesus. So there's Jesus, there's Francis carrying his cross. Now, uh, immediately next to the church, there's a museum. And the museum has something very interesting in it. 
There is a blue cross. Now, it's not in very good shape. You have no idea how much work I went through to get this picture. So you know, every place it says, no photo, no photo. So I'm the only person in the museum, and there's the curator. And she's sitting there at the desk. And I'm looking very busy, and I'm looking at all the exhibits, and I'm showing tremendous interest. And we talk back and forth, and she left to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I went, oh, happy day. <laughs> and I had five minutes to shoot my camera as fast as I could go. And so this is the authentic blue cross. And so what happened was that this is an icon-type cross, and it was commissioned to be next to Francis's tomb. And it was to go side by side, actually, with the San Damiano cross. And the San Damiano cross is primarily in red. This one's primarily in blue. One to emphasize Jesus's divinity. The other one to emphasize Jesus's humanity, okay? And so the blueness emphasizes his humanity. Now, this was only done 800 years ago, so the paint corroded on it and whatever, but they had records of what it actually looked like. So we've got the actual one, and then right next to it, we have a replica of it, okay? And here it is. Now, unfortunately, it was behind glass, and I had nothing but glare there, but at least I've got a picture of the original one in the museum. So you can see Jesus is there, and we're trying to emphasize the blue. So look at blue here, blue here, blue loincloth, everything. And then we've got the Blessed Mother and the beloved disciple as the only two witnesses. Now, I'm going to show you the San Damiano cross in a minute, and it's going to have, like, many witnesses. So these are contrasts in style artistically between the Blue Cross and the San Damiano Cross. Now here's another one. I was able to get up closer and eliminate a little bit of the glare. So you can see the Blessed Mother here. You can see the beloved disciple there and the paintings of, of, the, um, of the blue all in those places. Now, there's another one. So there was a gift shop not too far away and they had a very nice replica in the gift shop. The thing was about, for sale for about 3000 I thought I just left it there. Okay, but notice here that it's got the, the diamonds, four of them in each of those things. And so um, people have asked what was the original artist's intent with the diamonds? Four gospels, four corners of the world, four this, four that. There's not anything that's really clear. I've got an article, an article um, in your packet about the Blue Cross, and it has all of the different things that they think it might represent, but nobody knows for sure. All right, on we go. So I talked to you about the Tau cross, right? Tau is the Greek word for T, okay? And so the kind of cross that Jesus died on likely was a T cross. As a matter of fact, here is a T crucifix with a corpus on it. This is actually at the monastery at Crozier up in Onamia where I was. And so this is in the sacristy. I walked past it every day for 20 years, okay? And so the reason that we have this little extra cross beam up on the top Remember that they had the sign, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, the titulus? If you have a Tau cross, where do you put it? So artists just added that little piece up on the top so that you'd have a place to put it. Normally, you would have a vertical beam in the ground, and you would carry a cross, a horizontal beam that would sit in a notch on the top of that, and you'd be all set to go. So at any rate, the Tau cross. How, how does this relate to St. Francis? During the later part of his life, he never signed his name. At the end of anything that he wrote, he would just put a little T on the end. So that was his devotion to, the to, to Jesus and his cross, and that's the way that he identified himself for the balance of his life. Now that's a Tau cross. I can see that here, right here? Now this is a key. This is the tabernacle at his tomb. And so they put a Tau cross on it. This is in the basement level of the church of the Basilica of St. Francis. Now you know that I like the Franciscans up in Little Falls, right? This is their processional cross in Little Falls. So it's a Tau cross, but you know that we're very big into peace, right? You know, make me a channel of your peace. And so here's the um, Holy Spirit, the dove, and a symbol for peace at, with it. So I'm with all these Franciscan nuns, and they're wearing lapel pins with little Taus on them. So I'm asking, can I take a picture of your lapel pin? Oh, cool, sure, Father, you can do that. They know what I'm going to do with it, you know? So then you have a chance to see what that is. There's another Tau cross. Another Tau cross. Now, here we're going to our final pl place of the, our slide program. You doing okay? You're, you haven't, I didn't bring any, pop, I shouldn't do popcorn in church. <laughs> I like to do treats, but whatever. 
COVID, yeah, he can't eat. So this is the Basilica of St. Clair. You would expect that there would be a Basilica of St. Clair there too, in addition to the one uh, for uh, St. Francis. And so here it is. And so what happened was, is that, the, so this is another angle of it, is that the San Damiano cross, the cross that was in the San Damiano church, that Francis knelt before and prayed before, they kept it at San Damiano during the 13th century. But once this thing was built, they moved it to the Basilica of St. Clair, and they've got a chapel there for it. All right, and there it is. Now, it doesn't look all that good. It's in the chapel, and you know what the sign says there? No photo, no photo. And those poor Clares, they patrol that church. My goodness. So there I'm with my, pic my camera taking the picture. The nun came up to me and said, give me your camera. You know how much I cooperated with that? <laughs> you got the picture. <laughs> so this is, this is the original. And it's really, it's in very good shape. And I, it's a really a beautiful cross. And so, it's only, and so it was done um, in, the 11th, in, the, in the 11th century, we think, or during the 1100s, that would be the 12th century. And they don't know who the artist was, but it was kept in the San Damiano church. And so this is, um, is there a church in our neighborhood that has a huge one? There is St. Vincent's in Osseo. So they, they have one that's on the back wall of the sanctuary that's way bigger than our, our crucifix, maybe twice the size of it. So if you ever want to see one that's really a gorgeous one, we have one in our backyard. They have one that's not as big at Assisi Heights in Rochester, but this is the nicest one in our locality, and so I was able to be able to photograph the subparts of it. So here we have St. So Jesus is on the cross, and then we have all these people. Remember on the other one, there was only two, right? We got a lot more here. I've got it all described in your handout. So this is Jesus up close. And so the artist is doing, trying to do a couple of things. He's got his eyes looking out. So he's looking out to us. So you look into his eyes and you can see to the Father. And so through his eyes, we have connection to Almighty God in heaven. And he sees us and cares about us. They say that anatomically his neck is not the right size. They say that neck is just a little bit bigger than it's supposed to be because Jesus is the breath of life. I mean, this is a really a beautiful kind of way to interpret what's going on here. Then you look at his loincloth. Now, you know that um, actually um, during those days, crucifixions were naked, and so they put loincloths on people to try and um, just have it be more respectable, huh? Now, this loincloth is almost like modern deals, you know, the longer shorts and so forth. But look at what we've got with the drawstring and this. You see the gold on it? We're talking about the glory of the cross, that Jesus is exalted as king of heaven because he endured the cross. So he put the glory in it along with the passion. Okay? Now here we have the, the five major witnesses. So there's two witnesses on this side and three on that. So people would look at that and go, I wonder who they are. Well, we can figure it out. So it says here, St. John and Maria. So this is the beloved disciple St. John, and this is Mary. Oh, and this guy. Who could that guy be? We're going to try and figure it out. Okay, so this is a close-up of Mary and the beloved disciple. Notice their hands. You see where they're pointing? They're pointing right to Jesus. Both of them are pointing to Jesus, which is exactly what we want. You see how Mary's head is resting on her hand here in sadness? how John is looking at her to console her. Okay, so there's a St. John and Maria. And then we got that guy. Now, who could he be? See that? That is a lance. This is the guy that pierced Jesus' sword, or his side with a, with a sword. So his name is Longinus. And when you go to St. Peter's Vatican Basilica, they have a huge statue of him because after he pierced Jesus' side, he converted to Christianity. So they consider Longinus to be the minor witness and Mary and John to be the major witness. Let's go to the other side. Are you ready? Here we go. Now here are the three other major witnesses. One, two, three. I wonder who they are. So we have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of, I think, James, and the centurion. 
We've got it down at the bottom. There they are. Got to check that guy. See, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the centurion. Okay, let's go back. That guy. Who's that guy? These days, people sign their name to the bottom, the artist. In those days, they didn't sign their name. They drew a picture of themselves into it. That's the painter. All right. And then we've got that guy. So remember we had Longinus on the other side? Who could he be? Now, the, the artist, I, I'm surprised, didn't do it. He's supposed to have a sprig of hyssop there. You remember that there was a guy who took a reed and he put the little sponge on it and dipped it in the wine and lifted it up to Jesus' lips? That guy's name in tradition is called Stephanton. So Stephanton and Longinus are the minor witnesses, and Mary, the beloved disciple, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and the centurion, are the major witnesses. Interesting, right? Quite different than the Blue Cross. And there. That's right along Jesus' leg. We've got a little rooster. Cockcrow. And then these are the wounds. I mean, we've gone over this before. In, the ha in both hands, in the side, and in the feet. And then the thing on the bottom. Uh, I've got this explained in your notes, but it's very unclear. So they, there was a number of saints that were pictured here at the bottom of the cross, and they eroded out. So they've got one set of explanations says it's this group of saints, another one says it's a different set. I don't know that they know for sure, but the, 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 the guesses are in your notes. And so then we have the angels that are up on the top around the wounds, and we've got three other angels on this side, and then we've got all of the angels on the top. You see them all up here? And so we have a risen Jesus here, and they are all welcoming him into heaven. So that's the top of that. So I chase... So, um, so this is for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's right underneath it. And so this is Jesus ascending to heaven. And see the angels that are welcoming him? But not all the angels are welcoming him. This one's looking the other way. Um, half of the angels are looking at him, and half of the angels are looking at each other. Some are welcoming him, and the rest of them are talking to each other about what a glorious event it is. And that's it. I told you it would be longer than normal, and hopefully it was fairly interesting. I mean, so we get kind of the story of Francis's life as the first part, and then we get a chance to go to Assisi and look at the places in Assisi as the second part, and then look at the three great Franciscan crosses, the Blue Cross, the Tau Cross, and the San Damiano Cross to kind of wrap it up. So that was kind of the overall thing, and in your packet, you've got explanations of all of it we can still pause. Any questions or comments on our slideshow? Yes? Yeah, so the, the, the comment was, I didn't have any idea until I went to the Holy Land, the, the, the enormous impact that the Franciscans have. And so one of the articles that you have in your packet is the Franciscan custody of the Holy Land. One of the things I didn't do in his life story was talk about the fact that St. Francis made a pilgrimage to Israel. And he had a great soft spot in his heart for Israel. And so when he had 3,000 members, they had to organize them into provinces, okay? And so he asked, would some of them like to go to Israel and to be uh, on... So they had a province in Israel. So after Francis died, I don't know exactly how much longer it was after that, the Holy Father was looking for a religious order that could be the custodians of the holy sites, and because Francis had gone there and other founders had not, and because the Franciscans had a province there and nobody else did, they approached the Franciscans and said, would you take it? And they did, and they've been the caretakers of these holy sites just for almost 800 years. So right now, if you're a Franciscan any place in the world, you can petition your superior to be transferred to that province or to be loaned to that province. So you can do it a short term or you can do a long term in the Holy Land. But that's good that you noticed that. So, I mean, when I went to the Holy Land, I was talking to some of the Franciscans about, you know, how that all works. When you were there two years ago, the, the
course. And they left it on hold, for sure. So the point was is that the Jewish authorities, the Israeli authorities, were going to tax the, uh, the Christian sites in the Holy Land and the Franciscans, but they weren't going to do that to any of the, to the synagogues or to any of the mosques. So it was really targeted toward the Christians. And so the Franciscans played hardball with the Israeli government and said, if you're going to uh, tax us, we're going to close these sites down. And then, as you pointed out accurately, that would be terrible for the tourist industry and that would backfire for the Israelis, so the Israelis backed out. Those Franciscans, way to go. <laughs> so they have a, the, the head of their um, group in the Holy Land is called a Custos, a C-U-S-T-O-S. So I get a, 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 a journal called the Holy Land Review, and it's put out by the Franciscans, you know. And so you get this kind of up-to-date, uh, month-by-month what's going on in the Holy Land. It's great. Yes. No, you, your, your point is exactly correct. So uh, Liz was talking about when St. Francis had to go to Rome twice to get his order approved and his rule of life approved. So remember when I said in 1210 he went there and then he said no and then the next day he gave him preliminary approval. And then he went back in 1220 and got formal approval. So it was 10 years later. And I don't know if the Pope's changed, uh, I don't know all of the details about all of that, but yet you're, you're absolutely correct that he had to go twice. And that was right before he got sick. He got sick two years later and then died four years later. <clears throat> uh, other things, yes? Coming back to my first question. <laughs> uh, when was the, in his lifetime, where was the uh, Tenth Commandment put it again after he died? Or no, no, so the, the, the Ten Commandments happens during the time of Moses. And so the time of Moses is about 1400 1500 BC, and this is 1200 AD. So there's 2700 years separation between Moses and uh, St. Francis. So I mean, the Old Testament was all in place, and that would have all been scripture that St. Francis would have studied, and he would have known the 12 to 10 commandments, you know, and all of the stuff of the gospels too. And so when he went and did his preaching, he'd have done them both. <laughs> this is very good so Isabel's point is that the fourth commandment is honor your father and mother and it doesn't look like he always did that <clears throat> and so I mean his father would have said that he dishonored him but Francis would have said he was honoring his heavenly father you know so we, we can debate that yeah for sure yes That's a very interesting question. So the question is, how did Francis's re uh, relationship with his father progress after that? And I don't know. I, it would be very interesting to know. And you said that there's a movie on EW10. I'm pretty sure that there's more than one movie on his life. And so they would have, it would be loved to, right now, I'd love to watch a movie on St. Francis. <laughs> Today I was more thinking about Therese though, because I've got that movie. Yeah. Yeah, so the animal connection is that he had a, a, a great, great admiration for Almighty God the Creator. And he had a great thing about the outdoors and glorying in the outdoors and glorying in the animals and the plants and that we have to respect them all. So ecologists have kind of used him as a patron saint. You know, so regularly you will see um, uh, him around a lot of plants and the animals it's the entire creation thing. You know, brother, sun, sister, moon, we're looking at about all of the stuff on the cosmos and all of the stuff on the earth and seeing the glory of God. And that we should respect the environment. I 
uh, had to have been a very big thing in his ministry. And I don't know all the details about how that happened. So, you know, so I, I know that, you know, when we were talking about St. Anthony, how he preached to the fish. I don't know that he preached to the deer, you know, or to the birds or whatever, but uh, there's, there's, there's certainly, as, as you indicate, more to the story. Yes. Um, so the question is, were the people who joined the Franciscan community, were they brothers or priests? Um, initially, remember their OFM, Order of Friars Minor. So he didn't call himself monks. They didn't call themselves priests. They called themselves friars, and they were unordained. But if they're going to have mass on a regular basis for their communities, they've got to have some of them ordained. So some were ordained and some were not. So like my, you know, I've talked a lot about St. Anthony of Padua. So he had been an Augustinian. He shifted over to becoming a Franciscan and he was a priest. So he's a Franciscan priest. And so right now, even the Franciscan communities that are uh, around the world, they have mixed membership. You know, friars who are ordained and friars who aren't. The crozers that I was with had lay brothers and ordained priests. Same sort of deal. Well, the, the, the question is, do the poor clerics follow the rule of St. Francis? You know, I don't know what rule they follow, but they, they're pretty different. You know, like the poor clerics up in Sac Rapids, they're cloistered. They both follow a very strict vow of poverty. So the different orders have different views of poverty. So the Augustinian one isn't material detached. You know, like, no, it's equal sharing. That's the Augustinian way, where the Franciscan way, and I, I think the poor cler way as well, are about doing without, without, without. It's a total simplicity in all of that. But I, I, I'm pretty sure they have a different rule of life. I don't know that they follow the Franciscan, but I don't know that for sure. Yeah. Um, there, there's the uh, Franciscan Brothers of, I can't remember the Right here in St. Paul, the Franciscan Brothers of Peace. Last year, one of their members was ordained. So now they have a priest within all the rest of our brothers. That's correct. So Liz's point is that the Franciscan Brothers of Priest Peace here in the Twin Cities, they had one of their members ordained a priest, and all of the rest of them are brothers or unordained. And so he was ordained so that they would have someone who could provide mess for them, provide the sacraments for them. So they're very intentional. So they, they don't consider priesthood to be the ordinary way. They consider it to be the other, the exception rather than the rule. Yeah. The Blue Cross, yes. You don't see as much um, or hear about as much. As I was just thinking about the Blue Cross and the Red Cross and how we have things named that, like our Red Cross and our, like the insurance company Blue Cross Blue Shield. Do mm -hmm. you know if those have any connection to this Red Cross? Or That's a very interesting analysis. That So you're looking at the Red Cross and we have Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I don't know that there's any connection. I, I don't know that the Red Cross is talking about the divinity of Christ and Blue Cross and Blue Shield is talking about the humanity of Christ. I, that would be more of a, uh, that would stretch for them, I think. Are we good? So we've got a, a gospel passage that we're going to use for tonight too. And so we normally get to this a little bit earlier, but it's a shorter passage. And I think that we'll be able to proceed with it in a good way. So if you've got your second packet of notes, we'll go right there. Okay. So this is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. And hopefully you'll see the cross connection for St. Francis here. So Jesus said to his disciples, If a man wishes to come after me, he must deny his very self, take up his cross, and begin to follow in my footsteps. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would a man show if he were to gain the whole world and ruin himself in the process? What can a man offer in exchange for his very self? The Son of Man will come with his Father's glory, accompanied by his angels. When he does, he will repay each man according to his conduct. I assure you, among those standing here, there are some who will not experience death before they see the Son of Man come in his kingship. The Gospel of the Lord.
So we'll take now, as we regularly do, a couple minutes of silent meditation. So if you'd like to share a word or a short phrase with us, take up his cross. So when he does, he will repay each man according to his conduct. Come after me. Come after me. So whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So what can a man offer in exchange for his very self? Well, we redid just about the whole reading, didn't we? <laughs> Which gives you an idea of how powerful these words are. And uh, the, so we, doesn't, we don't have to reread it a second time, but I do think that there's just so much uh, power packed into a few number of words here. A lot of meaning here. So normally we would go to small group at this point, but we're not going to be able to because of our distancing. And so normally after a small group, we'd go into our kind of our large group discussion. So I think that we can do that at this point. So if you have anything that you would like to share about this or any um, observations or questions, we can move forward with those. Oh yeah, this is a very, so, you, uh, so Ken lifted one of the most um, confusing and troubling sentences in this reading. It says that the son of, the, the, before they experienced death, they would see the son of man coming in his kingship. So the discussion then is, is this referring to the second coming, the parousia, the final judgment at the end of the world? Or is it referring to something else? You're going to see the Son of Man coming in his glory. In the next chapter, I think, or two, he has the transfiguration, and the Son of Man is shown in his glory. So maybe it's not the final judgment, which is, I think, one of the places where the biblical scholars are coming down. And so they see Jesus in his glory at the transfiguration. They, they witness the resurrection. They see Jesus come again in his glory. They witness, or are participants in Pentecost. It's a moment where Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come and it would be a moment of glory. They witnessed the ascension. Um, they witnessed the foundation of the early church and how Jesus was present in the early church and how Jesus was abiding with them. And it was a glorious outcome. So, I mean, I've got them all listed as the, I mean, so, so, I, as I was preparing for this, I'm reading from one source to the next to the next. This one has that one, this one has that one, this one has that one. So I kind of collected them from a bunch of different places, you know, and so then we can have a longer list. But I think the, the one that has the greatest um, 
common agreement would be the transfiguration, which was going to be coming right up in a glorious moment when he came. Mm -hmm. So Liz's point was be, there was only three guys up there. And if we're going to talk about Jesus in his full of glory, we're going to have it displayed for everybody to see. That's not a very big crowd for there. No, it's not fair to the other nine. Or they could be representative figures for all of us, whatever. <laughs> they might not be too, right? How else are you doing? Are we ready to turn the page? Sure. I think we're, yes. This part where he says he's going to take up his cross, so Jesus is saying that. Is that like a uh, sort of looking forward to the cross that he's going to have to bear? Or is that sort of a common like saying that of the, like your struggles or your suffering that you've got to take up your cross that they would have known at that time? You so the, the question is, um, does it represent people's um, struggles and suffering? Or does it represent the, his individual cross? What is it about? So um, people of the first early first century in Israel, they'd all witnessed crucifixions. They all knew what it was. So when he says you have to pick up your cross, and they had seen all those things, it's exactly as you described it. It was kind of a, it represents all of your struggles and all of the hardships of life. And you've got to embrace them and carry on. So that was a very nice interpretation. Okay, let's take a turn. So this is um, the gospel for this feast day. or I, I shouldn't call it a feast day. It ranks as a memorial. And so um, it shows up in the daily readings, but it's a different combination of verses. It shows up on Sunday. It's a different combination of verses but this combination of verses fits perfect for St. Francis. There's material like it in Mark and Luke. And so he had just been to Caesarea Philippi. Who do you say the Son of Man is? He had just made his first passion prediction. The Son of Man has to suffer. And he doesn't mention his cross, but then he says you have to pick up your cross. So it's a very interesting connection there. And so the St. Francis of Assisi connection, why are we using this gospel for that day? So remember I was telling you he was at the San Damiano church and he was with the priest and he felt like God was calling him. And he says, I wonder what Jesus is saying to me. So he talked to the priest and said, let's open the gospel. Just flip it open to any page and we'll see what verse is there. And that's what he's trying to say to me. And so this particular gospel was the third time that they opened it. Okay. And so the third text was whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow after me. And so he, the other ones were about poverty and so forth. And so it's interesting that that was such a powerful event in Francis's life. And so he used that. I mean, you can see his devotion to the cross every which way. There are other gospels that you can use for his feast day, but uh, this is the one that gets used the most. Good with the introduction? Does the bell ring on Sunday? No, it does not. You're not supposed to ask that question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, her question is, Graham's question is, does a memorial outrank Sunday? And it does not. So what we are doing is like liturgically, um, the, techni the, te the technical word is illicit. <laughs> so there's um, licit and illicit, valid and invalid. Okay, so if you've, if you've got something that's invalid, it didn't happen. So if you had like and have an invalid mass, well, the, the Eucharist wasn't there and it all went wrong. But if, let's say the Father doesn't wear vestments. Well, you're supposed to wear vestments, then it's illicit. So even though it was a Mass, you did something wrong, okay? So are we still going to have a Sunday Mass? Yes. Will it be valid? Yes. Were we supposed to follow the 27th Sunday of Ordinary Time? Yes. Did we? No. <laughs> huh? They might take my camera. So this is, we're, we're admitting our being illicit in public, you know? <clears throat> a lot of times, if, you're, if you don't ask the question, people go, oh, we just had St. Francis had Mass on Sunday. It was great, you know? They didn't know that we were supposed to be doing the other thing. I wouldn't be up there on Sunday explaining that we're supposed to be doing the other thing. But now you know the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. You don't want me to lead you down the wrong path. 
We'll be honest about what we're doing. I told you at the beginning, we have a, have a great devotion to St. Francis, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we don't have an opportunity where his, his feast day lands on a Sunday every seven years, right? This is a golden opportunity. You've got to cash in on it when it comes. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. I knew you felt that way. Thank you. Thank you. So Jesus said to his disciples, so now Jesus is teaching, right? And you know that Jesus is the teacher. It's interesting that we were talking about the Ten Commandments and Moses because he's the teacher of the Old Testament and now Jesus is the teacher of all. And he outranks him. And so he's talking to his disciples and we know that uh, we're talking about the 12 apostles right now. Earlier he had been speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees and so he's got them pulled off to the side and he's having a private conversation with them rather than a big conversation with the crowd. Okay? Page two. So he says, whoever wishes to be my disciple, he doesn't say, you know something, I order you to do this. Whoever wishes, it's an option. And so um, Jesus doesn't force us to do these things. He doesn't coerce us to do us. What he's doing is he's inviting us to follow him and he's inviting us to pick up our cross. So we get to do this voluntarily, okay? We get to choose to do this. That's the way he wants it, okay? So you have to deny yourself. So self-discipline is an essential part of discipleship. You have to say no to things. Um, when I talk a lot of times in Lent about fasting and learning to say no to food is no big deal in comparison to saying no to temptation and sin. That's the higher ordered thing. So the better we are at saying no to things, the better we are we're going to be able to refuse things uh, when it comes to a higher order of decision making, okay? Now, self-denial. We talk about self-denial a lot during Lent. So we talk about giving up food, we talk about giving up dessert, ice cream, alcoholic beverages, candy, all these kinds of things. TV, is, that's what self-denial is, so I put an explanation of, of what it is in here. But is this the base kind of self-denial that Jesus is talking about? If you look at the capital sins, the main capital sin is pride. Everything revolves around me and my life and what I want. And if you're in the Jesus camp, everything revolves around Jesus. He's number one. I'm not number one. I deny myself so that he can be number one. And that is the primary form of self-denial that Jesus is looking, looking about, okay? And so radical self-denial proposed by Jesus. This form of self-denial goes beyond fasting to deny oneself. William Barclay puts this so nicely, means in every moment of life to say no to self and yes to God. To deny oneself means finally and for all to dethrone yourself and enthrone God. To deny oneself means to obliterate yourself as the dominant principle of life and to make God the ruling principle. You see how powerful that is? God's totally in charge and I am totally obedient to God's will. That's to deny yourself. I'm always going to do God's will. It's not about my will. It's about God's will. So that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? There's a lot to ponder. <laughs> okay, so then he talks about the cross. And so we talked about the cross there, okay? Grilling form. Um, in this context, you're going to like this next sentence, Durant. The cross represents hardships, struggles, and sufferings of life, particularly the troubles that come because you're a disciple. So if you're a believer and other people are making fun of you, my goodness, and the early church had tons of that. We're having more of that these days, are we not? You know, to be a Catholic, to be a Christian in the secularism that's moving forward in American society, it's not always comfortable to be. So suffering sometimes comes with it. So um, he says, take up your cross. We understand that that's a metaphor for adversity. He says, follow. And so Barclay says, following means rendering perfect obedience. That's the same thing as self-denial then, isn't it? So um, I, I'll never forget, I was at a, um, a homily that Bishop Robert Brom, he was the Bishop of Duluth at the time, and he ended up being the Bishop of San Diego, he just retired, and he says, when Jesus says, follow me, how many wounds do you have for the way that you have followed behind Jesus? And he was asking that as a rhetorical question. And he's going, if you follow close behind Jesus, you're going to have wounds. If you follow from a great distance, you won't. 
So the kind of suffering that goes on in your life, when he says follow, he means tuck right in, right behind me, step for step with me, walk along with me, and carry your cross while you're doing it. Good? Okay. So for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. This is a, um, a very interesting thing with regard to the early church. Whoever will save his life will lose it. How do you save your life when you're a Christian in the year 45, 50, 55, 60, and you get called in in front of a magistrate and say, are you a Christian or not? If you disavow Jesus, you save your life. If you say, I'm a Christian, you get put to death. So what, what, what are we going to do here now in terms of short-term games, short-term gains, or long-term gains? So you can have the short-term game of living for a couple more months or a couple more years, or you can have the long-term gain of being in eternity with Jesus in heaven. So the irony is that when you deny your life now, I'm a Christian, I'll suffer and die for him, okay? Then you have the long-term game of eternal life. And so we would use Peter as being the example of that. Are you his disciple? Oh, no. I've never been with that guy. Oh, you speak like a Galilean. Oh, no, I don't. See how he tried to save his life? When he's in the high priest courtyard, Jesus is going to be crucified. And if I say that I'm one of him, I'm going to get crucified too. How did Peter eventually die? He was crucified upside down. He got it straightened out. He figured it out later on in his life. He wasn't trying to save his life on earth. And by not saving his life on earth, he saved his life for eternal life. So the early persecutions are actually um, woven right into what's going on here. Okay? Yeah. Uh, pardon me? It's very sticky. And so the question that you're bringing up is a question that they had to wrestle with too. So if you're a mother and somebody says, are you a disciple of Christ? And if you say, yes, you're going to be put to death and then there's going to be nobody to take care of your child, what do I do? Do I disavow Christ to be able to be there for my child? Or do I um, say that I'm going to a Christian and then be put to death? If you look at the way the early Christians did it, they, they would never disavow Christ for the advantage to live longer. They always testify to their faith. But, the, the, but remember that there was a, a whole group of people called the Lapsi. Have we talked about them? The L-A-P-S-I? Those were all people that denied Christ, saved their life, the persecution was over, and then they wanted to come back to the church. And so that created a huge controversy in the church during the first three centuries while Christianity was illegal because there would be people whose families, they had lost family members and so when these lapsi came back they said, Our fam- we, I lost a mother, a father, a child, a this and a that and you want to come back? You got off scot-free and we suffered all this? So there was a whole group of the church that said that they shouldn't be readmitted and then there was another school that says there's nothing outside of God's mercy and the nothing outside of God's mercy school should have and, and did win, but the difficulty still remains. All right, we're at the bottom of page two, and we finished that, so we're on page three now. So you would gain the whole world and lose your life in the process. So what does it mean to gain the whole world? Most people think it means about money, but it could mean power, it could mean accomplishment, it could mean recognition, It could mean anything that you want it to mean, but a lot of times it means money. And so winning the whole world is not success but failure because this world is passing away. I thought that was such a Father Augustine stock as the one who made that comment. And we're talking about short-term gains and long-term gains here when we talk about money as opposed to eternal life. And so uh, what can you give for, for your life? There's no way to repay. You know, when God gives us our life, 
and Jesus gives us the gift of salvation, how can you pay that one back? So what we do is we do the best we can. We love with all our heart. We be as generous as we can. And then we are grateful for the gift of salvation and the free gift that God gives us. So it says now at the end that the Son of Man's going to come. So we're talking about, the, you know, the, at the end of time for sure, there's going to be a judgment and he's going to come with his angels in his Father's glory. So we're talking about after the resurrection and he's been enthroned in heaven and all of that. So is it the parousia or is it some other time? Well, those are not completely clear. I think that we're talking about both things. The angels are the ones who do the deciding. Now we're on page five. And so the Son of Man is going to be making this decision. So he's going to be the person who's going to render the final verdict. And so in his Father's glory, if it's in, in reference to the Father, that says that he's the Son, right? So that's the statement of his divinity. And when he says glory, this is a very careful balancing act. He just talked about the cross, right? So we go from cross to glory. So if you do your cross, as Jesus did, he had his glory. And if we do our cross, we will have glory as well. And then it says he's going to repay each person according to their conduct. Okay? So to, if you're going to do the repay, that's going to be executing judgment. And so this is interesting. Some religious denominations say that you can be saved on faith alone. How does that square with this? That you're going to be repaid on the basis of your conduct. Now this is in Matthew's gospel. When we roll up to chapter 25, he's going to say, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was in prison and you visited me. The corporal works of mercy are the way you get into heaven, not with faith. Uh-oh. We said works, not faith. But remember, St. James says that faith without works is empty so works are evidence of your faith. So you can't say one or the other, they go together. But if you have faith with no works, you have no faith, it's empty. So when we talk about being repaid according to your conduct, you know, whatever good deeds that we do, it can be the list of the corporal works of mercy, but there's many other things that we could do too. Okay, what else do we have here? Not very much. So the thing about um, um, some of you will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his glory. I've got all those listed out. So you see here how, how we've got the uh, transfiguration in the next chapter. And then the risen and glorified Jesus. And so Father Senior pr proposed that. And then Pentecost, that's from the Life Application Bible. And to all those who spread the gospel after Pentecost, that's from Bruce Barton in the Life Application Commentary. Okay, and then the present church with some of his disciples that they would live so long to see the church being built up, that's from St. Gregory. So, I mean, you can see that there's many different explanations and I'm not going to propose to be the person who's going to decide for us. We'll just take all of their explanations and hope that they will be informative. I think we've covered it. Do we have any last questions? Well, again, I would like to thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your wonderful participation. Um, so we'll be celebrating the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi this weekend here at St. Bart's. And uh, I think it'll be a tremendous celebration. You got the full slideshow. They're going to get the abridged slideshow. You can't do all of that in 10 or 12 minutes. <laughs> so there's a great advantage to being here tonight. So uh, thank you for coming. God bless you and take care. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs>